everybody is in the good room here. We're here to talk about transformational transformational change and new approach to Canadian policing. And we have many people uh, in the room again, many people interested in that topic. And we have amazing panelists that I will introduce in a second. But to start with, um, the two people that help us setting up that webinar are Dr. Michael Young, Program Head of the MA and BA in Justice Studies, as well as Dr. Tam Posobon, that is now the Program Head of the MA in Leadership. And my name is Nancy prévost maurice I'm an Education Specialist here at Royal Roads. If you can take a minute to introduce yourself in the chat, I would love that. Maybe letting us know uh, where you're joining from, what's your name, what you're looking forward to learn today. And you'll see my Zoom is a little bit glitchy, so it might take a few seconds before I change slide. Thank you so much. And at Royal Road University, we always start our presentation and events by acknowledging the indigenous land that we are on. So I invite you maybe just to connect your feet to the ground to start this presentation here and really acknowledge that the lands that you're joining us from. If you know which territory you are joining us, please enter it in the chat as well. And at Royal Road, we're really grateful to be able to learn, play, work on the traditional lands of the Lakwagan and Kosatsun families and nation, also known as the Sunhi and um, Esquimal nations. So all together, staff, students, visitors, panelists, we're very grateful to be here. And I'm just looking at the chat, many people enter some answers here, some presentation, that's wonderful, thank you. It's lovely to meet all of you here. And I'll get started. Sorry, I'll just need to introduce our panelists. I'm just looking to the slide. And this is the agenda for today. So we're doing the welcome right now, the land acknowledgement. I will have a great conversation with our panelists. We have three people joining us today. Then we'll do a little overview of the program and we'll answer questions as we go. So talking about our panelists today, we have uh, many of them, three people. Thank you for joining us. So I'll just uh, read you a little bio of all of us. They have a lot of experience, expertise, and knowledge to share with all of us today. So first we have Roger Chaffin. And Roger served with the Calgary Police Service for over 33 years, the last three of which he served as the chief of police. In his professional policing career, he has led most, if not all, operational and administrative functions that comprise modern Canadian policing. He has received his policing education locally, provincially, nationally, and internationally, has served in the executive of the Canadian Association of Chief of Police, the Alberta Association of Chief of Police, as well as served on numerous boards for not-for-profit organizations across Canada. Since his retirement, he served as a volunteer on several community boards in the Calgary area, provide consultancy advice on projects relating to policing in Canada, and sit as an advisor with the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform, advocating for systemic reform in Canadian policing. He has been awarded with the Canadian Order of Merit, official level, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, and the Professional Long Service Medal. He is a staunch advocate for strategic police governance, for contemporary reimagination of police legislation, and for a national approach to delivering to all Canadian systemic police reforms. Wow. I don't know, Roger, if you want to unmute and just say a quick hi. Hello, everybody, and, and, and thank you for uh, asking me to participate in the discussion today. Thank you for being with us, Roger. That's wonderful. Then we have Todd Preston. And Todd was just sharing with us that he's celebrating 25 years today with uh, 25 years of service. So we're really grateful to have you here. That's very impressive. So Superintendent Todd Preston is the current officer in charge of the West Shore RCMP detachment. He is happily married with two daughters, aged 19 and 22. Originally from Sherwood Park, Alberta, Superintendent Todd joined the Royal Canadian Mounted Police at the age of 19, completing a two-year law enforcement diploma at Grant McEwan College in Edmonton. 
Upon graduating from depot in 1997, Superintendent Preston was the youngest service RCMP officer in Canada. His 25 year long career has taken him to Redwater, Alberta, Edmonton, uh, Allard Bay, Nanaimo, the Yukon, and Victoria, and now the West Shore Department. So I don't know, Todd, if you want to say a quick hi. Yes, th thanks very much, Nancy, and yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, be here today with everyone. So thanks again for having me. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Dr. John Lilly. Dr. Lilly is vice president and a funding member of the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform, a registered charity. He is a retired physician, but continues as a clinical professor at the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Alberta. John is a member of the Alberta Premier's Council of Charity and Civil Society. He was chair of the YMCA of Northern Alberta Foundation, as well as co-chair of the Pregnancy Pathway Steering Committee for Homeless Pregnant Women until June 2022. He is a prior police commissioner in Edmonton, and John is proud to have established a consultation practice for nonprofits in Alberta, which is now part of the Edmonton Chamber of Voluntary Organization, and is called the Alberta Community Support Network. Do you want to say a quick hi, John? Thanks, Nancy. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, sure looking forward to your questions. Wonderful. I see there's already a lot of interaction in the chat and I will stop sharing my screen. We'll start the conversation here. Thank you so much. And Tom, over to you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, welcome, guests, and thanks so much for taking time out of your schedules to be with us here today. We, we truly appreciate it. Um, you know, the topic today is really about transformation in policing. And I, I can say from my career uh, of over 30 years in policing, um, the departments have evolved somewhat, but they don't look that dissimilar to what they looked like when my grandfather was, 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 a, was a boy. So I'm curious, when we, when we hear the term transformation in policing, what does that mean to you? And what do you feel a transformational model would look like? And there's no order here. Whoever whoever wants to jump in is is free to do so. Uh, if you want, Tam, I'll jump in to start the conversation. I, I think inherently the term transformation implies uh, something quite a bit more systemic than sort of the tinkering of the edges that can occur within the existing models. And when I mean tinkering the edges, if you think about how a police organization is structured. It often is, it starts with a hierarchical model of a chief and executive, et cetera, but they're always there for a short period of time. They're there for you know, um, an indefinite period, but generally fairly short. And so what they can accomplish in terms of change is really um, managing what's before them, what's on their plate currently. And to uh, so as Dr. Posbaum mentioned, then when the, sort of the music ends, you see all this work and what really changed it in the day because we keep doing the same things. I look at the, the, the rapid and intense change of community life, of the expectations of community, of the, the rapid advancement of, uh, of diversity and inclusivity, of human rights, of civility and community life, of you know, even the digital world and digital environment and how people communicate. And this intense discussion and these intense negative experiences about how communities are interacting with policing are not met by the tinkering of the edges of our police models. They're not met or they're not understood. And they often are met with defensiveness. They're met with some description of how good we've been in our history. They've, they're met with platitudes. And sometimes, honestly, they're met with um, uh, criticism and and. and sort of dissent from the police organizations. And I think quite honestly, the disconnect has been across North America and likely across the world of this need to actually say, we need to really reconsider the entirety of the service delivery model, how police organizations are prepared, how they're educated, what their legislation says, and how we sort of move connectively towards transformation, how we actually rethink what public safety really means, what social justice really means, how the intersectionality of human rights and safety and community wellness inter uh, react, and then how we de deploy a police model that works with that as opposed to works contrary to that. So I think the 
ideas are are not going to be born in one-off simple changes. I think, and some of those, you know, the changes here that we've uh, we continue to play catch up with is the mental health component here has has changed, uh, you know, policing far more than anything else I've seen uh, during my time. Uh, and we just, we continue to try to play catch up with that, uh, with our municipal, our provincial, our federal partners. And nobody can seem to come up with the right answer, the right balance between, you know, the, the help that these individuals need um, and how that, uh, how that affects policing and, and how we interact with those individuals. And I, I, I mean, I can say wholeheartedly that that is probably the single greatest challenge right now in terms of trying to find change within our organizations uh, on a frontline policing. Um, this is at the, the, the bottom of the, um, really the, the grassroots, the frontline policing officers. Um, it is just day-to-day -day, um, mental health and, and trying to find and work with, you know, educators, provincial, like I said, provincial, municipal, federal governments to try to find something here uh, has, has been a real challenge. I have to speak to that, Todd. You're so right that uh, the world is changing fast. Mental health is at the prime. Uh, and I think a good part of the change that requires the police to catch up to is related to the increased acceptance by individuals in society of talking about mental health, of discussing wellness, of seeking solutions related to homelessness, there seems to be a deeper social caring in the world. And of course, that heightens concern about uh, those same problems that police have always been involved in. We at the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform really see a, a need for the citizens to have more participation with police. Uh, and first of all, we would suggest that it would be reasonable to look at police recruit curriculum and add in the tools in that curriculum that can fill up the toolkit of frontline officers. For instance, emotional intelligence is a really critical skill. And Royal Roads, uh, I was discussing this earlier, has an amazing uh, program uh, to train counselors, uh, coaches, and they must have deep emotional intelligence in order to read what's going on with uh, the clients who consult them. And police are facing clients, in other words, calls for service, they go out and they respond and there's, a, there's a perpetrators and victims potentially. And, and it's really good if there's not that immediate danger component to talk things over to gain understanding of where each individual is in their mindset and in their personal circumstance and it, sometimes solutions can evolve just through careful conversation so that's why we would see emotional intelligence as a critical area for change now in a way i'm down in the weeds when i talk about that what i'm really saying is that the curriculum overall has a few gaps and the toolbox could fill up with knowledge of for instance indigenous culture knowledge of where refugees are coming from uh, we know now that we need a lot of immigration to Canada in order to pay for the seniors who uh, still require more and more health care after they're no longer contributing to the economy. So to build our dynamic society to tackle climate change, it's critical that uh, the immigrants come and with them comes diversity. And we see that in our world, the 21st century Canada today. A refugee, for instance, who has perhaps left a war tour in Ethiopia, uh, comes to Canada with a great fear for police. So that was probably the single frame in their mind when they're stopped uh, at, on, the, on the highway. And so they're starting from a place of fear, whereas the police officer is starting, in a sense, from an unknown, unless they understand that uh, there's a different mindset for Ethiopian refugees as one example. The need for citizens to be involved in curriculum, I think would be very powerful. It would help enhance trust 
with police. And as the curriculum evolves, that trust would grow as well, since I believe we'd see a decrease in, for instance, complaints filed by citizens about police uh, methodology. Training would, I think, go a long way to helping police uh, be trusted. They're a critical need in our society. Police will never go away. They're needed. They do a lot for people in a time of need, and they're critically important, ever more so than ever, because of the, by the polarization in society. I better stop talking. <laughs> uh, it's, it's all good, John. Thank you for those. Thank you to all of you for, for those insights. Um, you know, Roger, you alluded to, to this, the systemic change is, is, is what we're kind of talking about here a little bit. And how do we how do we become a catalyst for that? And when I look around the world at some of the organizations that have experienced some systemic change and I'm thinking predominantly of, of the UK, uh, some of it in Australia, and, and certainly I, I had the opportunity to, to visit the Netherlands and experience sort of their progressive model that they have there. And it's been a painful experience for them to go through these transformations, um, usually as a result of some sort of catastrophic event that has been the catalyst for that change. But when, when you look at it for, for that type of transformation, because when I, when I think of, of, of Duxbury's research around the barriers to change in policing, she points out that most of them seem to come within the, from within the organization itself. So if that is the case then, where do you see the leverage points of being able to be that catalyst for change here in Canada? Well, and a good, a good analogy, uh... Dr. Posbon, it's this is the like I'll use the UK analogy, for instance, as the complex uh, nature of that uh, of this response is the UK, how it's set up in terms of its political uh, atmosphere is, you know, is a parliamentary system much like ours. But as they look across policing across the UK, for instance, there's 50 one or two different police agencies across the country but all governed by the Home Office, all sort of governed by one set of common uh, accountability across the nation. And if you, if you lay that over top of what Canada looks like, you know, our constitutional framework uh, you know, divides authorities between federal and provincial governments and policing is one of those areas that has become a provincial responsibility. So you look at all the provinces from coast to coast, 10 different provinces, a set of territories, all have different governing bodies. They have different legislations. They run across a multitude of municipal, provincial, First Nations, federal policing, all with different administrations, all with different training requirements, all with different communities to serve in. And then wonder why, you know, we struggle so much with a coherent idea of how to actually, you know, to attract change. And then you also get this idea of this defensiveness of each agency defending their territory, defending their their history, defending, you know, the, 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 the good intent of each organization. And it just gets bogged down. Everything gets bogged down in, you know, the, and, and the transient nature of their executive staff all gets bogged down in short periods of time. And, and, you know, even in our province in Alberta, you know, of the major chiefs, they often think very differently about this topic. So you can't develop a coherent uh, systemic pathway to reform. And the UK, what had happened there, as you described, was more or less the government getting frustrated with that disconnection, that incoherence, that sort of lack of, uh, of a unified approach. And they just simply said, we'll do it to you, uh, you know, as from a government lens. And this is where they created this significant change within their overall structure, both from how people work in the industry, how they're educated in the industry, how they're measured and governed in the industry, and then allow that to become a national uh, approach to a sort of a divided uh, institution like policing. And it does come with a lot of pain in the early days, it, breaking through the, the paradigms people have established for themselves, breaking through the incestuous nature of policing, uh, you know, not to be, you know, to make to find a point of that, but so many people start in that industry of policing and stay there for decades. So you bring the past with you. You bring the past before you got there with you. You to unhinge yourself or uncouple yourself from the institution requires breaks in that. And so they, Canada has, if in my mind at least, has the least the political. Uh, strength and the political opportunity to make this happen. They have the community voice to get into transformation. It's really bringing all that together and finding 
all orders of government, whether it be municipal, provincial, or federal, to come to the table unified and say, we are going to lead change on behalf of Canadian citizens and not sort of leave it on the plate of individual chiefs. And I, I'll just, I'll get off this so other people can talk, but imagine the scenario where, you know, there's 180 some odd police chiefs in this country across different organizations. They all got to their desks at different times. They all have different levels of education. They have, they have no connected governing authority or regulations to work with realistically because they're all separate and they can't all seem to see the same issue at the same time, the same way. And, you know, therefore the likelihood that you can create transformation can't start at their desk. It has to start at the area of connectivity through federal, provincial and territorial minister levels to say, this is something Canadians want. This is something we can deliver and we can do this in a thoughtful evidenced solution-based way that begins with the legislative framework and the structure to which policing is delivered to our communities. Roger. And Roger, one of the one of the challenges that we've uh, we've certainly seen out here, I think there's a 11 or 13 communities just in the Greater Victoria area. Where we talk about uh, you know trying to get everybody on the same page. You've got you know that many different mayor and councils, and and because of the mechanism of of how policing is a provincial responsibility, then handed down to anybody in this province over 5,000 uh, pays for their own policing at various levels. Uh, so you have your mayor and councils. Um, that are dictating this is what they would like to see and they are paying for that service so it's tough and we do find it tough when the province and the fed federal government um, and you're seeing it actually right now in alberta um, where they're trying to impose certain laws or, or um, policies and procedures and the municipalities push back and say well we're paying for that service and so that is one of the hindrances when we talk about um, institutional change it makes it very difficult when the, you know, when we're trying to change something, but the person paying the bill has a different uh, thought process. Thanks, John. John, we'd, we'd love to hear you. You're going to have to unmike. Sorry, Ted, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the uh, transformation implies huge change, a uh, lot of upset and, and both uh, Tam, well, at Roger and Nancy, or sorry, uh, uh, Todd, you've spoken to that, and it's, I think the only successful transformation occurs when it's externally driven. It can't be side of the desk, it needs to be center of the plate. And how do we get it there? I think Roger alluded to that, the concept that uh, there needed to be some common ground. And one approach to common ground would be to have a college of professional policing that would work independently of the police, but in cooperation, governed by citizens and police together to develop the national standards needed uh, for the police curriculum and for how police operate on the street. So for instance, use of force guidelines are currently under development through the, uh, the CACP, the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police. Uh, and those Right now, there's no mechanism for those to be accepted, to be put into place in all those 180 services that Roger described. If we had a standard that was vetted at the college level, it would be far easier to, to roll it down uh, and seek, seek a concord concurrence across the nation. For instance, if we had uh, some funds flowing from the feds that put some teeth into a college of professional policing, uh, and if we had a demand by police who are want to be trained to a national standard and want to be certified as proficient in their in their uh, in their skill level, then that demand without compulsion would actually help us move towards national standards. Thanks, John. You you raise a really really good point here, and that is kind of what is the role when you think of professionalization as part of a reform. In policing, then, then what role can education play? And when you when you sort of look across the country, every with every province's responsibility for their for their own policing services, you know the redundancy in the training and 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 the resources it takes to to maintain that model individually for each province is is costly to, to everybody involved. So I'm from the panel's perspective, what what if any uh, role does education play in police reform? Well, it has to be. To me, uh, it has to be a significant 
a, a keystone or foundation of reform. And again, this sounds like uh, condemning officers. And I think to do this well, you have to elevate our, our view of this above the individual officers. If you, if you thought about the, you know, the, the tens of thousands of officers across Canada and the, you know, the couple, a couple hundred thousand or so down in the US and all across Europe, and they're all having very similar negative outcomes, negative approaches, feedback from the community, yet there's no connection to them other than the model that they're delivered and how they're led and how they're sort of presented to communities. That's the commonality, not the people. So there has to be something at the foundational levels and education's part of it. I mean, if, you know, as we talk about, we've been trying to talk about as to, to as much audience as we can get to is an electrician, a plumber, uh, a, a, you know, a welder has more certification level than a police officer does. That has more connection, more standards to put to that than a police officer does. And I, and the way to sort of put that into reference, the average police officer in this country likely has more authority to interfere with your charter of rights and freedoms or intersect with those things than almost anybody, including a politician would have. They have the right to put hands on you. They have the right to remove you from your home, to enter your home, to enter your businesses, to suspend your, your freedom of movements, to, you know, to incarcerate you. And at the worst instance, they could actually uh, end your life uh, in, in certain circumstances. Yet we have not attached education, standards, and a leadership model to reflect the in intense seriousness of that. This is likely, although it's independent from government, or politics and theory, uh, it's like the most intimate form of government that any person will ever see, and they'll see it every day. Yet, we look at the people behind those in those vehicles, we look at the people who do their best to uh, serve with some level of dignity and honor, we're not presenting them with the opportunities and the education level and the frequency of education to keep them current with community needs. The, the, the distance between what communities are, how they're living today, and what their expectations are and what we're setting up police to do in the communities is going to be a constant source of friction until we can actually at least address the idea of evidenced research-led education and constant education to keep police officers and the that service delivery model to be relevant to the communities they're serving in. Uh, I think you hit the, the nail on the head there, Roger, especially when you talked about uh, consistent and constant education. You know, you, in, in our world, you finish depo six months, you go, uh, you do your six months, and then they kind of wash, wash their hands, say, here's your car, and off you go. Um, I think there would be, especially now with online, uh, you know, to, to partner up with the, the colleges, the universities, the experts, the, the people that can really um, have the time, the energy, the knowledge, skills, and abilities to reach into some of these diverse communities and give us some feedback as to how we could better approach certain circumstances. For instance, I was at the Southeast, uh, South Asian uh, temple the other day, and similar to what John was talking about, um, some new Canadians were talking about how, you know, they used to get beaten by sticks by police in, in, uh, in India. Uh, they have zero faith and trust in the, in the police here. But, you know, growing up in Sherwood Park, Alberta, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't come across that. Uh, I, I was pretty, fairly sheltered and privileged. So, you know, having people and being able to articulate uh, some concerns and some change that needs to happen within our organizations. And I mean, I couldn't think of a better platform than using our, our university, our college students and, and uh, doctors uh, to help us guide some of the continuing education. Uh, yes, there are certain, you know, bare metrics that you have to meet coming out of your, your training facilities in Calgary and Edmonton and all the municipal agencies and depot. But I think it's the, I think where we really miss the, the mark is the continuing education. And I think we have a great opportunity through their universities and colleges to address that. The uh, helping professions are all professionalized in Canada, nursing, lawyers, accountants, doctors, lawyers. Now in the case of doctors, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada uh, is the model that the CCPR would could see as informing any new model of professionalism for police. When we talk about professionalism, what do we mean? We basically mean that uh, individuals joining a profession are trained to a certain standard using evidence to define that standard, that the trainers have good skills in education, that the environment is ethical, 
and appropriate, that the individuals are evaluated, and that that process of evaluation is under the control of an independent body. And then they go out to practice and they're licensed. And in the case of physicians, they're not licensed by the Royal College, they're licensed provincially, but they need to meet the standards of the Royal College to be certified as specialists, to be licensed to practice as, in my case, I was an anesthesiologist. And then in the course of their career, it's understood they need to meet certain uh, ethical standards. Uh, and you can imagine what all those are, that uh, the patient comes first in the case of doctors, that uh, we, will, we will do first do no harm, uh, that we will discuss with the patient, that we will uh, always get consent from the patient, that when we don't know, we will ask somebody who does know, and continuing education, which you mentioned, Todd, uh, is a critical element of all professionals. So many credits a year, and each individual is responsible to achieve those credits. And with those credits, they can remain certified. And then there's the disciplinary side. The College of uh, Professional Policing that we envisage wouldn't involve discipline. That remains the way it does now provincially, and it should be independent. The standards evoked by a federal college would help determine whether discipline is necessary if there's been a breach in professional practice. But, uh, you know, that's a matter for the provinces or in the case of the RCMP for the feds. Well, well thanks, John. And um, I, I, yeah, I, the, the role of education and how it can be integrated into policing could probably be its own, its own webinar unto itself for sure. But, but thank you very much for, for those insightful comments. And at this point, I would be, I'm gonna look to the chat to see if there's any questions here that we can open it up from, from some of our attendees here. Um, Bruce says, uh, without better funding, would frontline police be able to implement all of the required education? And I think, you know, he's perhaps, and Bruce, if I get this wrong, let me know, but I think you're, you're kind of alluding to the complexity that, uh, that uh, um, officers are, are being required to, to wrap their heads around, or would they be forced to ignore the training in order to keep their head above the water? So it sounds to me like there's almost a polarity there. Uh, do we have the resources to actually provide the education and training that is required to meet the needs? Thoughts? I think it's, I think it's a great question from Bruce. And uh, I think from any sort of public institution, the answer seems to always be we need more, we need more money, we need more money. I think this discussion really sort of breaks out the idea that we need to rethink what we're doing with our investments and where our money goes. If you were to put your mind, Bruce, to First Nations policing, for instance, and the perversely unfair funding model that they get year to year, the inconsistent funding model that they get, uh, and ask if they could do any of this, of course, they would, in their current construct, they, the, the answer could simply be no, because they just have such uncertainty and such inconsistent delivery through their tripartite agreements where how funding arrives. So to answer that question well, you'd really have to break away and say, that has to be part of the transformational change piece as opposed to just keep adding. What, what we've done in theory, what keeps happening with public institutions that struggle is the answer always seems to be give them more money. You keep adding more sources of revenue to broken models and wondering why it's not really changing and you're not getting great value for the return of public investment. I think it's this, is that, you know, a large organization like ours, for instance, was running on, you know, when I was with the Calgary Police Service, it was running around $500 million a year. And uh, you multiply that across, you know, the, the service across the country and ask, would more money make a difference? I actually don't think it does. I think what matters first is to reimagine what level of service makes a difference, how to prepare people better, how to rethink the way to which we, it's almost, it's almost just to say, and I joked about it when I was, you know, or sarcastic about it a bit when I was working was if we could just go dark for six months, if we could stop working, if we could just reimagine ourselves, rebuild the model, I think I could build a model that with this current set of resources would be meaningful. But because you're 24 seven, because you're deep into the, you know, the, the system that you're already in and dealing with the, the acute issues of the moment, that the ability to be transformational is not available to you. And to some extent, as Dr. Lilly said, this is something that should begin at the community level at a, at a very much at a, between academics, 
politicians and community is to actually build the model that would work better and then look at how to implement it as opposed to just asking, could we put more money into the system? Uh, I, I think that is always fraught with the same result uh, and it's usually a poor one. Thanks, Roger. Um, comments or thoughts, Todd or John, before I move on to the other one? Well, I think, Tam, that uh, the Usury Police Service, as an example, the call for an Alberta Provincial Police, these are requests for transformation in some sense. But rather than this piecemeal approach, why don't we do a great uh, national model that would work independent services, but just create the professional background. Um, James uh, puts a striking question in the chat here. He asks how Indigenous governments are not really being mentioned as part of uh, the policing change in Canada, which is an interesting thing to consider. I and mean, when we think of the colonial models that we are, we are saying are not working anymore, and they're, and they're certainly not serving us in the manner that we want them to serve us. Um, what might that look like? Because we're looking at, at bringing in an entirely different new, new worldview, um, more connected to each other, more connected to both relationships. What would you see that as being an opportunity? That's a good question from, from James. I'm not qualified to comment. I'm not Indigenous. Mm -hmm. Nothing about them without them. And that uh, applies to so many people in, in the world today. Uh, in the case of the Indigenous people, I refer you to a couple of really great uh, individuals. One would be uh, Daniel Belgar, who is the uh, uh, chair of Indigenous Police Governance in Canada. He's got some great precepts about how we need to move forward. And we would love to meet with them closer. We have Rose LeMay on our board, and she's uh, CEO of the Indigenous Reconciliation Group in Ottawa. I can, if I could just, just add to it a little bit, I, I it's just by coincidence, I do, I have been sort of integrated with a First Nations group in my area. I'm doing some consultancy work with them. And really to, you know, the, to observe is as we all strive across this country to reflect some idea of community policing as a term, most agencies I find have a very difficult time describing what community policing is. They use the word a lot, but can they really get there? You work with a First Nations police service and see how intensely successful they are of embedding their, the culture of their nation or the culture of their community into the service delivery model of policing acro across such a difficult environment of, you know, of funding and challenges they would have to be sustainable given their structure. Yet they could be the model for all policing about what a community really looks like, how to show that community, not just in sort of the more patronizing or more sort of virtue signaling ways, but really genuinely lead that service in a way that reflects the community. And I think they there is such opportunity in those models for us to improve, yet they are often not thought about uh, or not thought about seriously through the legislations, through the sort of the odd structure that happens within this country and the opportunities there to learn from and to really um, you know, evolve with what they've already been able to accomplish. Thanks, Roger. Um, go back to the chat here with the, uh, Nathaniel asks, with the perception, with the perspective of new model design in mind, how can we change the culture of the police? And uh, he, he puts in brackets in the military. Or, or probably any paramilitary organization so that we can sex successfully move away from the last 23 years, 20 to 30 years, pardon me, uh, around the misconduct and everything that we're hearing on, on, on the news these days um, and address the, the historical lows we're seeing in recruiting and retention. So even, you know, even creating a profession that people want to be a part of, it's actually a reasonable, reasonable question. So. Um, so it comes back to culture, which we know is, is, a, is a hot topic. Um, and uh, I, I'm, open, I'm open to thoughts on that. Culture has always been um, the villain around being the, the barrier to systemic change in policing. Y your thoughts, what, what, what can we do about culture? Well, I believe that a uh, professional approach would result in a shift in culture over time, Tan. And Nathaniel, your point about the uh, the major negative news we've received about police very regularly now. I believe in primary prevention. 
And the solutions are complex. First of all, there's so many homeless, there's so many uh, untreated addictions. There are, there's such a huge font of need out there. Our best bet is to have a healthy society. We could talk for five hours about that. Uh, and then there'd be less need for police to do as police do. And then with professionalization and by filling the toolbox of every police officer, or maybe I should say their belt, with the abilities they need to uh, end events without using force any more than necessary, uh, then there'd be less complaints. Everybody you talk down to a satisfactory circumstance, and then you could take them off to the police service for for you know a conversation that's one less potential use of uh, a weapon so there's lots of work to be done the solutions are complex and everybody has to be involved thanks tam if you need to mute me or or, or anything during this answer please do because i think you know where likely where i'll go with this one is it's a uh, uh, I, I think it is again one of those that's a great question it's one of those foundational challenges about reform is do you even understand what your role in community is if you're going to deliver a police service this is this idea around are you here to enforce laws uh, and use that sort of the, the force of um, coercion and aggression and, and, and harm to enact your business or are you here really for um, to improve the, the nature of community life. Public safety, to my mind, has a much stronger connection to community wellness than it does to prisons and incarceration. The, the better a community functions, the more dignity in a community, the more access they have to services and the more inclusive people feel, the less likely you're going to see negative outcomes that are resulted in crime. Yet we are forcing so much of the justice system into problems that that don't actually create solutions. They actually may even create more harm. And so our officers are often tasked to do things that really they're ill-suited to deal with. But it also then speaks to their premise. Uh, Dr. Posbon and I were working at a time we were looking at, as an example I raised, and this is where she'll probably mute me, is the looking at the ethos of the Canadian military, for instance. If you thought about our paramilitary nature, the ethos of the military is very specific. It's very well-written, but it has to do with confronting and attacking the enemy and protecting our country and even killing the enemy if necessary. And my question I posed to her then was, does that sound like policing to you? Are we here to confront the enemy and kill the enemy and use force against the enemy to somehow protect the greater good? But if, we, that, if that isn't the answer, why do we keep looking like the military, hiring from the military, trying to somehow emulate that model and somehow said that could look like effective policing? The ideas of our own ethos, a common understanding, a common purpose for which our guiding lights would be about why we come to work every day, where social justice and community wellness and the solving of problems for people and helping communities become more uh, agile and thrive more and feel more included, uh, somehow are not within the models of policing because we get lost in this, this sort of colloquialism of we're not social workers, we're the cops. I thought that somehow is fundamentally where the culture starts to anchor us away. I, I was sharing with uh, Dr. Posbaum when we were working that listening to a, a justice give an oath, the oath of office to new police officers and such an impassioned, eloquent speech about what it really means to hold this office, to, to go out in the community and to sort of interact and you know, make people's lives better and sort of the whole intention of this but to say to her, that's the last time any of those officers will ever hear that. That's the last time they'll see it in their careers. The last time anybody's gonna to talk to them about it, they'll go off to do something else. And I think those are the underpinnings of culture and reform that can be attacked, they can be changed, but it begins with the fundamental question is, do you even know what your role is? What you're really here to do? And if you find a thousand officers giving you 800 different answers, you'll can see right there uh, where the problem starts in terms of culture and this approach we currently have. Thanks, Roger. And I would never mute that. I can't hear that enough, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Uh, a question here from uh, Kathleen. Uh, how would the police gain support on the job and at the police college level? 
uh, would coaching and consulting be considered? Uh, I've, been pro I've been interested in providing this service as someone whose father was an officer for 25 years. So I'm, Kathleen, maybe you can qualify that a bit. I'm not sure if you're asking about uh, the opportunity um, to teach at, at, at the at police officers or what, any, any thoughts on this gentleman? Is the, what, uh, and I, I'm not sure if Kathleen's added anything else, no. I'm gonna give this to Todd because we've talked over him here. For yeah, no, it's, it's all good. <laughs> I think it, I think it reverts back to perhaps uh, the continuing education uh, part about hey we, we, when I went to Grant McEwen in, in Edmonton we had those uh, those partnerships um, as students with the police and they were able to hear back from um, you know the the, the college uh, students I think there is a yeah certainly a uh, an appetite there for for more learning to hear and just to go back to the last point there with Roger you know it, it's funny. Um, we send members here at West Shore up to Nunavut um, for the sole purpose of, of trying to better understand uh, First Nation culture and communities. And so that's one of the benefits of the RCMP is we can ship members for 30 days and they go do relief work in these, in these communities. And it's incredible. I think that to me, when I hear back from their experiences, they talk about, they don't really feel like they're policing up there, that they're ambassadors for the community up there. Uh, and so when they come back to these bigger centers, uh, it's kind of exactly what you think of when it's policing. You go a call to call to call, and, and we have small groups of people here that try to build the inroads within uh, these detachments and, and municipal departments. But when you go to those smaller communities, boy, you can sure you can sure see the difference and kind of a shift over the years here, especially the last couple of decades uh, of the role. Uh, and exactly, especially our First Nations, where you know it used to be us and them type of thing, and now it's it's the ambassador role and. Um, you know, wanting to understand their culture, wanting to understand how we can be better or better serve them um, as clients. And so it is a great program. Uh, and I think that we it's something that perhaps we underutilize when we talk about learning on the job. What bet not opportunity it is to go see firsthand and live within these communities. Um, it's, you're, you're certainly going to learn a lot more from that than you are a textbook. Um, so anyways, just, uh, just thought I'd throw that out there. I think that's that's a good analogy too. It's uh, I, I think the struggle from a Canadian, you know, from that view, from an overall Canadian standpoint, is the uh, the lack of consistency with that level of approach that you educate through research and policy and experience, but you deliver it in a measurable way. You deliver changes of outcome. You deliver uh, you know the experience of communities, and and you make sure that that's available across the board in terms of a, you know, the, some of the greatest harm, I think, or not harm, but the inequities are to see such intensely interesting effort happening in one organization. And then people applauding that, but wondering why isn't that in every organization? And like, why can't that happen at a systemic level as opposed to the goodwill of, a, of a, an area, a detachment, a service or something? And I think those are some of the opportunities as to the original question there, the, I think that you know, the real, you know, challenge is always going to be is, is this country is simply like railroads and other academic institutions. We are just literally ripe with great research, great researchers, great, you know, uh, thesis that have been written or papers that have been written and they just languish on a desk someplace. And the opportunities for advanced education or advanced leadership models, advanced outcome expectations simply just sort of either get picked up by an individual agency or they don't. Uh, I think having a centralized model to allow for that, that research to come together, those uh, issues to be addressed, and then the, the delivery out to the organizations about best models, best practices, best education standards could happen. And it could happen at a, at a much more thoughtful level. Because I think, you know, we often would hear from an individual that said, geez, I'd love to come into your organization and teach on this subject. And, you know, as much as we'd like to do that, often you know, we're bound by, you know, other challenges about why that didn't occur the way it could have. But I think at a systemic level, I'd love to see the clearinghouse effect of getting research done, getting it in, getting it informing policy, get education developed from that, and then watch outcomes happen as, 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 with, you know, as a result of changes of education, or as, as Todd just explained, there's so many great opportunities in this country, but it's unfortunate they only happen in silos. We don't really see them uh, systemically enough. 
Thanks, Roger. Um, Tab. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, Tab, I'd just like to ask Nancy to post a link. And this is good food for thought for everybody. It's a link to a news article in the Edmonton Journal, sorry, an opinion editorial piece in the Edmonton Journal today, actually from a friend of mine. And he writes some very cogent words that bring back to something I discussed in our preparation for this event today, the concept that civil society and policing need to be more in integrally involved. There needs to be not just uh, conversations when problems need to be solved, but uh, a full, deep and ongoing collaborative process. Uh, and, you know, as, as Todd said, when an individual officer is embedded in a, a remote Arctic community, they have a different perception of what community means. The same applies in the social services world. If police are working deeply in that community, uh, perhaps as recruits or perhaps uh, assigned just to work in there as officers uh, without their uniform, then they get a different sense of that community. We need solutions to the, uh, to the drug crisis in this nation and maybe the best way of tackling it is with a full full out collaborative process uh, where we dig in deep and that's just food for thought read the article and make your own opinion thanks john you know um I, I'll, I'll admit my my bias right, right now I, I believe that education plays a, a critical role in in whatever transformation but tied to that is uh is leadership and the need for leadership. And, and Roger, as you know, when my, my dissertation I wrote around, one of the questions I, I was looking at was, was senior leadership and their thoughts on what makes it effective. And uh, I, was, I was a little bit taken aback by nobody talked about change. Nobody talked about the importance of leading change in a time when change is happening all around us all the time. So I thought that was an interesting disconnect. And, and I'm curious, um, you know, when, Roger, you know, when, when the leadership is strong at the top and, and there's a strong vision for, for where we're going, sometimes that's not enough if it's not percolating through the organization. And I wonder if, if you know, if there's opportunities there, perhaps, that, uh, you know, education can kind of open up the possibilities, open up the minds, change the mental models around what is even possible. Because I think it's, it's not that people, you know, how does that saying go? Police hate two things. They hate the way things are and they hate change. So it's... <laughs> So how do you, how do you how do you provide the possibility to open up that mindset right and I believe it's it's through through education and learning and and ultimately through leadership at all levels within police organization and leadership within our government to have the fortitude to support and drive the policy changes necessary to create the environment for change so it's been a wonderful discussion gentlemen thank you so much I'm going to turn it over to to Nancy at, at this point and Nancy thank you so much for facilitating for us. You're so welcome. Thank you, everyone. That was fabulous. I think we get a lot of great discussion happening in the chat as well. And I'll just remove the spotlight here. And just yet to end the session, let me just share my screen again. And please keep the conversation going in the chat. That's great. I think we just wanted to mention here, let me just go back to the slides, just two programs that we have at Railroads, kind of the two schools that have partnered with us today to make this discussion happen. And I, I know that already some of you have mentioned in the chat directly to me that you're already enrolled in a program or you're thinking of applying, so that's amazing. So we have the Master of Arts in Justice Studies. I don't think Michael was able to join us today, but Michael's a fabulous program head, he knows so much about justice to study. So feel free if this is a program that is of interest for you. Connect with me, connect with our team, and we'll just uh, provide more information. And Tam will be able to talk about more, uh, a little bit more about the Master of Arts in Leadership, as you just mentioned, how important and relevant it is uh, in this world. And we have the key dates here. So we have an application coming up, uh, a start date for December 2022, with another one coming in 2023. Uh, and I won't go too, too deep in details. I think we don't have a lot of time for that, but those two programs, again, yeah, super relevant in the world we live in. And we have people at Rare World, working professionals. We have people from many spheres uh, coming all together in our programs. And I think that's very beautiful to see. 
Uh, and if you want more information, this is a question that came in the chat as well. So you can always connect with the enrollment team at learn.more at railroads.ca. And you can connect with the school directly at those two emails here. If you want to take a picture of that or a print screen, uh, that's fabulous. And here to end, we, you have our social media, so feel free to follow Railroads University for more webinars happening, other events, and just a chance to connect with the, everybody that you meet today. Any final word, Tam or, or panelist? I'll, I'll, I'll let Todd, Roger, John, anything further, any final comments that uh, you, you, you would like to share? Oh, thank you for the opportunity to speak, and uh, I enjoyed it. Yeah, likewise. Tons of fun. Good way to start the weekend. Oh, it's only Thursday. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to doing it again. Well, well, thank you to all three of you. Uh, it was it was a great conversation. I know we just kind of scratched the surface a, a little bit, but uh, I, I really enjoyed the insights and the dialogue from the chat. So, so thank you so much. And yes, to anyone who might want to learn a little bit more about the Master's of Arts and Leadership, I would be happy to feel free to reach out to me personally and we can engage in some conversation. I, I can say that um, I took the program in 2010 and it absolutely was a transformational experience for me. It reinvigorated mm -hmm. my career in policing when I had actually started the program as a transition out because I didn't think I was going to be successful within my position. So it really was transformational and it helped provide agency for my leadership and recognize that we have the ability to create change. We just have to be willing to take those steps in the, in the sphere that we have. So with that said, I love talking about it. I love our program here. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Gentlemen, thank you again so much for your insights and your expertise. It is truly appreciated. And I do hope that we can maybe continue this dialogue some other time. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care, everybody.